Well, I was born in Ogden, Utah on November 23rd, 1948. Uh, my mother didn't get to hold me for two weeks. I was blue when they pulled me out. I'd had the, uh, the tube around my neck and I was put in an incubator for two weeks to uh, see if they could bring me back around. So just stories of a, of a hard birth and I was, I was blue from the start. I can sing the blues really well. Alfred Randall has an Alfred, Alfred Kofid, and uh, James, my uh, father's middle name was James, Roland James Kofid, so I've got his uh, father. So it has good significance to me. First and most vivid memory, vivid memory was um, we, before we moved down to 6th Street in Ogden, we lived up around Bonneville, and we were in a little home, and I remember um, being three or four and being out and being chased by a dog. Well, there was uh, a small house, 900 square feet. Um, upstairs, there was my parents' bedroom, and then there was a bedroom off to the side and a bathroom. Downstairs, originally, it was just an unfinished basement, and we lived in an unfinished basement for quite a period of time, maybe the first eight years or so. And uh, we had kind of different corners. I always had to sleep with somebody. So we had a, a queen-sized bed, and so nobody could ever roll over onto our side. We had a great big rope tied down the center so you could never get underneath it and cross my side. My dad was born in uh, Idaho, uh, not too far from Lava Hot Springs. Uh, he, his father had a farm there, and so he uh, worked on the farm. He was quite an outdoor guy. Uh, at 12 years old, he got uh, contracted polio and spinal meningitis. Uh, it was very serious. They brought him up to the University of Utah Hospital, and his bowels had backed up, on, up to him where they thought he was going to die. He made it through that. And um, then he went back to, uh, to Lava Hot Springs, and then they eventually moved down to uh, Ogden, Utah, on about 13th Street. My mom uh, was born in Ogden. Uh, her father was a uh, uh, kind of an engineer of sort. He was uh, a guy that could work wonders with anything. He worked for the railroad and he had a little shop that he built a bunch of things in. And um, he was a, a short Englishman with uh, red hair that was always kind of a crew cut. He uh, was a little bit snappy, kind of scared of him, but in his older age, he, uh, I know he would always play gin rummy with my dad and my mom, and we were never quite good enough until he got a little older, then he'd let us start playing him in uh, gin rummy. And uh, he always used to tell us stories, and his stories would always end in the English style. When he wanted the story to end, I stepped on a piece of tin, the tin bended, and now my story's ended. So that's how we always cut that off. My grandmother was just uh, the sweetest, cutest little gal. Uh, I would go there occasionally and stay overnight. Um, their house was really small, and they had a patio that they had put screens over, and that's where my mother slept. They had kind of, it was colder than crap out there in the winter, and that's where they slept. And when I'd go to her visit sometimes, I'd sleep out on the porch or there was a little teeny couch in a little soft spot that they had there, a little, little space. And I would sleep there and I always remember getting up in the morning and uh, my, uh, my mother, my grandmother always made bread. Her bread wasn't like ours that was um, really kind of soft. It was really kind of um, firm, very firm. And uh, you'd put it in the toaster and uh, would not be quite a cracker, almost like a cracker and with butter on it was phenomenal. And so she always did that. She always had parties for uh, one of our cousins who was uh, a little Down syndrome. We always went there for his birthday and we always had uh, fried bread. So that's where I got into the habit of uh, fried bread and we would eat it until we'd bust. So it was always fun going up to their house.
I was always disciplined. I was a harsh boy. It wasn't me, it was Brandt. But uh, my dad was really quite strict. Uh, once in a while, well, you just wait until your dad gets home. and Dad would talk, but he also had a nice belt that he gave you on the backside for uh, bringing you back into a line. I don't know that I displeased my mother too much, but I had a we had a, a canal that was down at the end of our block and we would always make boats and uh, we would always go float those in the canal and she would get so mad. She uh, had a rubber fly sweater and she'd sneak up on us, just pound us on the butt as we would bend over the canal laying down, smack us with this fly sweater all the way home. So that was her form of punishment is the fly sweater. Their marriage was uh, extremely solid. Uh, I never heard ever a cross word or an angry word. Uh, that's kind of what made me be how I'm like. Uh, there was always love. There was always uh, goodness. Uh, you look at them and you go, how could they possibly live like that? But they, there was harmony. There was never an angry word spoken. Can't ever remember one. We were... Uh, my father's occupation, he was an accountant. He was the controller for the Western Region IRS Center. He did all the accounting and uh, reported. He'd fly back to Washington with his uh, spreadsheets on those uh, long spreadsheets with the green columns, and he'd have his handwriting that was so nice. You know, we didn't have anything. Excel wasn't there, so my dad was the uh, human Excel sheet. Uh, he worked at the depot all of his life. As far as in the neighborhood, I think that uh, we were in the middle. There were a few other neighbors, you know, those to the uh, west that were, uh, had more money than we did. Uh, so, you know, we lived in a middle income family, no extravagances. Uh, my dad, you know, with his polio, he always loved golf, and he got us into golf when we were maybe eight or ten years old. We always had a set of uh, golf clubs. Uh, in the spring, he'd always take us out to uh, one of the great big uh, yards out in the, uh, the warehouses that the U.S. government had, and we'd hit balls, and then we'd have to go gather them up. And then uh, when we got fairly good, he'd always take us golfing, and um, we'd golf two or three times a week, and. 27 to 36 holes on Saturday with my dad and his brother. And uh, he loved to bowl. He had a one step or two, he had a one step and a slide delivery, and his average was 178. So he was a phenomenal athlete, even with his handicap. All right, so Dave was the oldest. He had a different father. My mother uh, met a guy, and they had Dave, and they got divorced. He was not a, a nice man. And um, so Dave was seven years older than me. Um, he was a good student in his younger years. I don't know that I had that much to do with Dave. Um, but as I was getting 15 and 16, he had come back from the uh, Marines. He was a Marine. He uh, was going to uh, skip the last part of high school. But mother wouldn't let him. She said that he, she would sign his papers as soon as he graduated. So he graduated and went to Marine Corps, and he was maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and maybe 135 pounds. And when he came back, after the first six months, he came back at 5'8", 180 pounds, just a bulldog, just unbelievable. And uh, he and Brent, which is the next to oldest, never got along that well. Brent was always... Uh, Brent was the taunter. Brent was always in trouble. Uh, anytime Brent wanted some money, he'd take you for a ride in his car, and then he'd say, give me some money or I'll drop you off and you have to walk home. So he'd put me in his car, he'd drop me off to North Ogden Pass, and then an hour and a half later he'd come and try to find me and I'd hide because I knew he'd catch crap from Dad if he didn't bring me back home. So, you know, he would take me and then I'd always hide from him and make him real nervous. Uh, Brent was always a practical joker. Uh, 
when I was maybe six. He was rototilling the garden. He asked me to move and I didn't move, so he ran over my foot with the rototiller and it sucked my leg in the blades and ripped my shoe off. And uh, once I was running on the side of the yard and he shot me in the back with an arrow. Once I was asleep on my bed and he shot me in the butt with a dart. So he was, he, he was always in trouble. Uh, we got along pretty good. We golfed. We did stuff, but uh, he liked to use us, I guess you could say. Steve is my younger brother. Uh, he was much taller than me. In the ninth grade, we walked to school, so in the ninth grade, he was 14 inches taller than me. He was in the seventh, I was in the ninth. And I said, let's get one thing straight. We'd get within a block of the school. I said, don't you tell anybody you're my brother or I'll kill you. And uh, we got along pretty good. I let Steve do all the stuff with me. And uh, Steve and I were really, really good. We'd, you know, just like brothers, you can imagine, you get into it a little once in a while. But uh, Steve, I always let him come with me. We always uh, did things together. I know I got my, my 10 speed bike when I was 17 and talked him into getting one when he was 15. And first ride him, I took him up Ogden Canyon and coming down, he let the tire slip off the road and he went to correct and he fell on the asphalt at about 25 miles an hour with a truck screeching behind him. He got just ate to the bone and bloody and put him in the back of the guy's truck and took him home to mom and she was flabbergasted. Uh, but, you know, he and I skied together, golfed together. Uh, Kathy was my younger sister, two years younger than Steve. Um, obviously, she was the favorite. Uh, I love to get her in trouble. We would sit at the dinner table and uh, Dad liked it quiet during dinner. And I would, I'd always pull a face at her and she'd start laughing. I'd just be straight faced and Kathy, I've told you how many times I want you to be quiet. It's Alf. I'm not doing anything. So I always gave her a little bit of a problem. We, uh, we were good. Uh, she always, I don't know what, she always thought I mistreated her, which wasn't the case. She uh, always felt like the neighborhood girls didn't like her. So she was always feeling picked on. Uh, so we weren't, we weren't quite as close. Uh, so uh, all of us boys worked together. Our uncle was in charge of the Utah employment. And uh, so we always, uh, he got us jobs picking beans, picking cherries. I hated that, only did that once. Picking beans, I could make a ton of money off of beans better than anything else. And uh, he'd always get us, uh, we would sell pop and stuff at the rodeos and the 24th of July parades, parades. So at an early age, I was out there, ice cold pop. Yeah. There we go. We always did. Uh, we had two trips and every other year we did that. We always went on a trip. We either went to the Bear River Campground in the Uendas, which is the first uh, campground past the Bear River Service Station. We always had our spot, our rock. It was a great big boat, kind of. We'd all sit on it and play all day. We'd get sticks and uh, there were rocks across the river and we'd all try to wade across it to see, jump from rock to rock to see if we would not get wet. And Mom would follow us and oftentimes slip in. We thought that was pretty funny. Uh, we always played uh, cards at night, pinochle, canasta. Um, I can remember being in a tent uh, and it was a, a tent that was given to my dad, one of the, the work gifts that he got, and it always stunk, didn't it, Jan? It was that canvas smell that was unique. And it would be pouring outside, and we'd have the lantern hanging from the center of the tent, and we'd all be gathered around playing canasta or cards till late. We camped. Uh, we always went, uh, if we didn't do that, we went to... Yellowstone, we were always stayed at Fishing Bridge, always stayed at the little cabins with a Black Bell stove. We'd always go at night with my dad and get wood for the stove. And at night, that was back when there were bears. You'd look out your window and there would be a bear there, so you'd have to wait to go to the common bathroom. And then you'd run like heck and look out to see if one was in the trash can and run back. So we always went places. My dad 
Love to camp, love to fish, love to golf. We did all that together. Every year, we always went somewhere. Yes, we had uh, Lassie. Lassie came with us from uh, when we moved to Bonneville. So I was three years old and we had Lassie till maybe I was 10 or something. We had a, a pet rabbit. Pet rabbit did really well till in the fall it got left out on the gra grass and froze with an early frost. That made us not too happy. And we had the cutest little dog. It was called Happy. Loved that little dog. We only had her two or three months. She ran down the street, and got struck by a car, and I remembered my mother brought her home and the dog sitting in the garage dead. And I put a straw in its nose and tried to blow air in its lungs to bring it back to life. That didn't work. So I always had to do something. Always on my bike. Uh, I always had a job from the time I was 12. I was working. I worked in the peony acres next to us. I'd hoe those for 25 bucks an hour and he'd take me down to a five acre lot and I'd hoe those. So I was always trying to get money. Um, I played uh, baseball. We were in the poor neighborhood, so all those kids up on the top of the hill, they had their uniforms and we had a t-shirt that said four leaf clover on it and our jeans. and. We played them all anyway, and we did really good against them. We'd always... So we, we took our bikes everywhere. We never were driven around by our folks. If we went to a baseball game, I don't know. They may have seen us once, but we always played baseball. Um, baseball and golf, I never played basketball. Um, thing I liked to do as a child about two blocks away from us was a large canal that uh, went and we would get inner tubes and float the canal with a paddle that we made and uh, float, you know, five or six blocks down and then walk back with the thing. There was a lot of scrub oak and everything and we had cut out the scrub oak and had our own little huts and things in the scrub oak and that's where we'd spend our day goofing around on the canal and in the scrub oak. And if we weren't golfing or something like that, so very active. Oh, the foods I like to eat as a kid. Uh, my mother's, uh, her Sunday dinners were phenomenal. Her uh, Swiss steak was the best ever. Nobody's been able to duplicate that. Her fried chicken was great. Her trout. My dad would always go up to uh, Yellowstone, the Madison River, and he'd go with his friends. And they would bring back an ice chest, about like that, full of fish. And we would, uh, he would clean them, we'd freeze them, and we would uh, fry them up. They always like to fry them in egg batter and uh, Ritz cracker crumbs, and the fish was excellent. So chicken and you know the Swiss steak and the fish, I love that. Hamburgers, hot dogs, grilled cheese. At an early age, my mother made me French toast, and I think I was six or seven. I always made my own French toast, my bacon. Uh, what I hated, I hate all forms of eggs, scrambled, fried. Hard-boiled, they make me puke. Hated them. Uh, I hated liver. I hated cauliflower. Uh, and you had to eat everything before you left the table. So I'd always talk to them. When they turned their head, I'd stuff something in the napkin between my legs, or I'd stuff the food down the empty table leg. Mother always wondered why her kitchen stunk. If they hadn't had that, and when I'd get through, I'd walk outside and throw the crap in the peonies that, that I couldn't stuff in the legs, so that was me. Yeah, my mother always used to buy me penny jeans. I hated them because everybody wore, in junior high school and high school, Purcells were the tennis shoes and uh, Levi Stroud, and, and you had to have a shirt that had one of those tabs on the back. And she bought me pennies. I hated it. And so from the earliest time, I always worked to save money to buy Levi Strauss and jeans and shirts and to get enough money so my dad wouldn't cut my hair. He hated the Beatles, and so he would cut my bangs. Oh, sorry, I blew that. So as soon as I had money, my dad never cut my hair again because he always screwed it up. I don't think we had an allowance. We had tasks and work that we had to do, but I don't ever remember getting an allowance. 
you know, we had our golf pass. All of my money came from, uh, I sold spud nuts when I was young, all day Saturday. I'd make maybe 35 cents or something. And I remember saving up for a transistor radio that probably cost me two bucks. I did the money from uh, the rodeos and the parades and the beans and all of that, and I saved my money. But I don't remember getting an allowance. Went to uh, Lincoln Elementary School and then uh, Highland High School, Highland Junior High, which was about a mile away from us. We had to walk to that, never got a ride. And then Ben Lomond uh, High School. Uh, I was always a good student. Like I had straight A's in junior high, high school. Uh, if I ever didn't quite get an A, I'd argue with the professor. My mother, Jan, always thought, geez, it worked. I always had good grades. I was a good student. I loved uh, my sixth grade. I loved my uh, sixth grade teacher. He uh, got us into uh, taking plants and... Uh, what do you call that, where you take a limb off one and stick it in the other and have it grow, tr transplanting? He taught us that, so I thought that was extremely fascinating. My uh, favorite class in high school was uh, everybody took uh, home ec where you learned how to cook, auto mechanics. Everybody had to have auto mechanics to understand how to work on their cars. But outside of that, I had a creative writer teacher, an older gal who was just... Um, that was that was one of my favorite classes, learning to creative writing. I enjoyed that. Uh, so my friends, I had a, a good core of friends. Um, they were all in the ward. Kevin Charlton, which I, he's still my doctor. He's a good friend. Mike Van Leeuwen was there. Uh, Keith Lithgow. So Keith Lithgow and I were always golf buddies. His dad was a golfer, so was mine. and. Keith Lithgow and Larry Lithgow and Brent and I always went out for a foursome. We always golfed together. Uh, Kevin uh, was always, uh, we'd go to shows or movies. I don't know that we played that much golf. We were on the same baseball team together. And Jay Eckersley and lived up by Kevin and we, we, they weren't, Kevin was a golfer, but Jay was just somebody I goofed around with at school. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Kevin Charlton and uh, Micah Van Leeuwen. We, uh, those were two guys that I went skiing with. We always had a ski pass at Snow Basin. We always went skiing together. You know, I'd save my money for a season's pass at Snow Basin. And uh, we always had to have the latest and greatest equipment. I remember when I was uh, a junior or a sophomore, uh, Mike Gerard and I went down to Perkins store, which was the elite in Ogden with their ski stuff. And we bought um, Fisher Presidente skis and Lang Flow boots and Miller bindings. And we thought we were king of the mountains. And uh, so I golfed, cycled and skied. That was my activities. Uh, one thing we did on it as a child that was kind of fun that uh, Keith Lithgow and Kevin Charlton and I and we walked the Mormon Trail together. We started in Petersville and walked up to East Canyon Dam and around and we took the wrong trail. We ended up or towards Park City and had to catch a ride to come back. But we uh, had collected little uh, tarred apples or something like that and we had wrist rockets and we'd shoot up everything that was in our way for two days. So we had a ball. My role model was my dad. My dad, despite his disabilities, he there wasn't anything that he wouldn't or couldn't do. So I always grew up believing that there isn't anything I can't do. And that's how I've always approached life. Uh, didn't care what it was, didn't need to know about it, I'd find out and I'd do it because my it's, that's how I was brought up. So my dad was my role model. Christmas, we always had a, a Christmas Eve dinner. We always had, which was phenomenal. We always had Thanksgiving dinner, Easter dinner. We always celebrated um, the holidays with a great dinner. Um, 
a lot of times in the summer, the holidays, we would go up to the Uendas and, and have a cookout outside in the Uendas. Uh, my dad always took us fishing, so the holidays were always spent uh, with a good meal, but uh, if there was uh, an open spot on the fairway, it could be 30 degrees and we'd have to go play golf. I always golf before, before Thanksgiving dinner, and a lot of times you had to have orange golf balls so you could find them on the snow. I was a bad child. Uh, I always liked to sneak up. <laughs> we were down in the basement and there was always a door that slid and you had to be very careful with it because it would make noise and, and my dad would wake up, but I was the expert at moving the door. No one could ever hear me. Um, as a kid, there was a nightmare theater. They wouldn't let us watch it, but they'd go to bed and about 11.30, I'd come up there, I'd open the door, sneak it, sit right in front of the TV, and I'd watch the Nightmare Theater. It had Vince, you know, all the, all the old horror movies I watched. And so I saw one time we had a, was a yellow Jeep. It wasn't remote control because then you didn't have remote control. You had a battery pack that you carried in a control unit and a, a steering wheel that turned the Jeep. That was, I thought, the neatest thing that ever was. And then two Christmases in a row, we had erector sets. And I still have the one downstairs, which I poured both of those two years in there. And we would build Ferris wheels, windmills, everything. You had instructions and you just put it all together. So it was really creative and uh, we loved the erector sets. Uh, for the longest time, I always wanted to be a dentist. And uh, that was something I always was going to do, and I don't know what kind of uh, took me away from that. Uh, my dad said, you ought to try accounting. I said, what's that? You know, and he showed me a little bit, and I had a class, and I, I really loved it, and um, switched me over from wanting to be a dentist to an accountant. But, so growing up, I always wanted to be a dentist. The big world events. I remember uh, the Korean uh, War and Uprising because Dave went over there. He was a machine gunner. Uh, and yeah, that's when he went into the Marine Corps, so I remember that. Uh, the, I remember the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember the landing on the moon and that Jan was watching it with uh, Bruce Hunter instead of me, that really always upset me. Uh, we had the Vietnamese War that came into being and um, we had a lottery. And uh, my number was selected as one of the first to have to be, had a pre-induction physical. So I went down to um, Salt Lake, had a pre-induction physical and uh, three days before I had my pre-induction physical, I was skiing up at Snow Basin and uh, and deep powder and my ski got caught and I reached down to grab my knee to lift it up and when I looked up I had three pine trees coming to it about 30 miles an hour and I one hand for the face and one hand for you can guess what I hit the trees so solid and I just laid down there and moaned for a while and I got up and thought well geez that wasn't too bad I don't feel too good but I'll I'll catch skiing tomorrow I came up the next day and went to make my first turn and my back just went out on me just horrible pain and I found that I had a, a, a sprain of the lumbar section of my spine. And when he took the x-rays to do that, he found I had scoliosis, which one hip was later, greater than the other. That's why whenever I'd hike, I'd get terrible back pains. And then a week, uh, two weeks before that, I'd had my wisdom teeth pulled and I bled for three days. They had to give me something to stop my teeth bleeding. So when I went to see them for the physical, I had flat feet. I was a bleeder from my uh, teeth. I was allergic to wool and I had the scoliosis and they said, get out of here. And I says, oh, okay. And me and my friend that I went down, we both flunked it and were so happy because we were, we had met our, our two uh, future wives. And so I was delighted that I was, I flunked my physical. <laughs> Inventions that came out. Yes. Uh, it was fun to have your car from where the biggest thing going when I first had my car, and I had my car at 17. As soon as I could uh, save the money, I bought a car. M my dad 
I had $900 saved and there was a 64 convertible 327 Impala four-speed. We came down to Salt Lake to drive it and I was in love with it. And he wouldn't lend me the 300 bucks. I had to settle for a 62 four-door Biscayne. I always hated that and I've always made up for it. I've always had fast cars because of what he did to me on my first car. So cars were a big thing. So it was fun when they finally had, instead of a speaker in the front, you could have a speaker in the back. And then people had four track stereos. I never had that because that was too much money. And so you had your stereos, then different things there. You know, every latest ski binding that ever came in, we had the top ski gear ever. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of uh, inventions at that point in time. You know, jets were already there. Uh, probably the neatest inventions was our, uh, you know, our space program and uh, all the different foods and fabrics and everything else that it brought about along with it. Uh, we never watched TV during the day. We'd maybe watch uh, the Kennecott Movie Theater or uh, Bonanza with my dad. Every night, we never were in the house. We were always with friends. We were out till late, always on our bike, always playing, always doing something. Never, ever had a game to play. So we were active, always active, never sat around. That's the difference. Favorite hangout spot as a teenager? Um, I didn't get to hang out that much. Like I said, from the time I was 15, I always worked. I didn't get to play on the school golf thing because I always worked. I'd always uh, go to Weber State and uh, I always went to, to work after night. So there wasn't uh, a lot of hangout spots. I was always working. Um, the places that uh, my hangout spot was the golf course. Um, we would, with friends, uh, in high school, we would always go and, and be with some friends and we would meet the girls at Ogden High School. Our favorite spot was Tony's Pizza. So I always went to Tony's Pizza and White City Bowl. And we always loved to go down on Saturdays to the uh, Birth Anna rolling, roller skating. I was a fabulous roller skater and uh, I enjoyed that. So, you know, White City Bowl, Tony's Pizza, those were our hangout places. Oh, Jiminy Christmas. No, just phrases like that. I learned how to drive as soon as I had the opportunity. Dad was always taking us on trips, and even when we were 14, do you want to slide over here by me and drive? Well, we always did. Made my mother mad. And uh, I remember being 15 or 15 and a half, and we're going to Lava Hot Springs, and. Uh, I'm driving and we're going down that big steep hill before you get to Madison and the front tire blew. And you know, my dad said, just take it easy, don't do anything, just, just keep the car straight, just put your brakes on slow. So I brought the car to a stop with the front tire blowing while we were coming down a real steep hill. So my dad taught me to drive. Uh, I always had a, uh, he used to have a scooter for the golf course and I had a Cushman scooter when everybody had their good-looking Hondas and all these other motorcycles, you know, everybody had a Honda 50 or 250 or whatever, or Triumph, and, and I didn't have the money for that. And before I had my car, I had me my dad's Cushman motorcycle, which was a big, green, ugly thing. It was about this wide, and it was about eight feet long, and it had a big cushion seat, and you'd get up on it, and there was a thing, you'd jump on it to get the thing started, and it would go, top speed, maybe 35 miles an hour. And I would uh, put my golf clubs on my shoulder and I'd ride out to the golf course, which was, you know, seven miles away on that. And I would take it up to school and I'd park it right in the middle of all those triumphs, this great big ugly green Cushman. So, you know, and as soon as I was able to drive a car, I bought that uh, when I was a junior in high school, had the uh, that Bel Air. My graduation from high school, uh, I know we had a party the day before. We had all gone up to uh, 
Pine View Dam and swimming where you know the people would sign yearbooks and all the other stuff and had a good time. One of our good friends that weekend, uh, Doug Compton, who was the uh, athlete of the school, the He-Man, he dove off of uh, Cemetery Point and broke his neck and killed himself. So that was tragic. But our, our graduation, you know, some kids went places. None of my friends did. A friend and I had bought uh, Peugeot's 10 speeds uh, six months before, and our graduation was that we uh, put the bikes in my car and drove down to uh, West Yellowstone and then got our bikes out and rode from West Yellowstone to Old Faithful, pulled in there late at night, and uh, we didn't have any money, so we were going to sleep out on the lawn, and the ranger said we couldn't do that, that we had to buy a... Uh, a cabin. We didn't have any money for a cabin. So we had our sleeping bags rolled up in a plastic. And he says, the only place you can go is uh, West Thumb, which is two continental divides away. And we started out at 9.30 at night to ride there. And uh, it was like 26 miles, two continental divides away. And he says, by the way, as you approach uh, West Thumb, we have three bear traps set because we've had problems with bears so my friend and I took off, and it's 11.30 at night, and we're coming down those roads to get into West Thumb, and the moon's out, and we're just screaming down the thing, and we get to West Thumb, and everybody's in their power Dodge wagons and their Airstream trailers, and so we're out on a parking lot. One guy gave us um, a piece of bread we split. It was big of him and didn't have any food. My friend's 200 pounds, so he could go a week without worrying about food, and at 55, you know, with riding all day, I'm done. And so we stretched out our sleeping bags in the middle of all these trailers in the middle of a parking lot, going, I hope we're not going to be some snack for the bears. The next morning we got up, rode 26 miles to Fishing Bridge, had breakfast, and then uh, we decided we'd head out. It was raining quite hard, and we're headed out to Hayden Valley. As we're going, somebody came up in a truck and said, Hey, my wife would like you to get in the back of our truck. There were bears up here by Artist Point, and she feel nervous that you're out on I said, hey, we said, go away. We're out on our senior trip, you know. We're just going to ride. Thanks. Have a nice day. And we headed off, and half an hour later, he came back. He says, I can't do this. My wife is just so upset with me. Take a look at this Polaroid we took yesterday, this brown bear with his head right at our window. We looked at it. The bear's head filled the window, and we said, sounds like a good idea. So we packed our bikes in. We went. There were three brown bears down by Artist Point. So after we got past Artist Point, we rode up to Tower, and we thought, we're not going to sleep another night out with the bears. So we rode from Tower all the way back to West Yellowstone, which was like 80 miles to get out. And we would ride, and we'd come around a corner, and there's a bear, and you'd go, geez, I hope he doesn't chase us. We'd just be cycling like heck go around. They never followed us, but it was quite a ride. And when we made it to West Yellowstone, we went for two nights to the big dances they had with bands. And so that was our senior trip. Pretty exciting. College was easy. The only one I could afford was Weber because I worked at the IRS. And so I had no other options. And uh, like I said, I'd gotten that one uh, accounting class and liked it. And that set my precedence. My first job, I got at 15 um, at a restaurant. It was my second grade teacher owned the restaurant, the Four Leaf Clover. And I went in and said, hey, I'd like a job. And I was five foot two, skinny little guy. She says, oh, I'd give you a job. You're not old enough, but you'd have to be able to carry a 100 pound sack of flour up on your shoulder. So I'm afraid you can't do it. And I said, well, where's the flour at? I went down, put the bag on my shoulder, come up. I says, is this what you're asking for? <laughs> she says, yeah, because I, even though I was little, I'd do a hundred push-ups. I had sit-ups. I always did things to keep in shape. And um, so I got my job at 15 or 15 and a half washing dishes. I'd come home at night, you know, after midnight or one o'clock. Then I got a job. I think I got paid 90 cents an hour there. I got a job at Wayne's Guards uh, doing groceries for 95 cents an hour and worked there for three years. I think I made it up to a dollar ten. Had friends that on that dollar ten were buying uh, 396 Malibus and 396 Super SS Supersports and 
then lay a streak of rubber from one side of the parking lot to the other and I had my 62 Bel Air, no competition. And then from there I worked at uh, the IRS. We worked in the old base we were in, kind of in adjustments where we would um, get returns that had problems, we'd find out what was wrong with it and we would uh, help fix them. And then from there I had an interview and uh, uh, passed some tests and that became an internal auditor uh, for the IRS my last year and a half and uh, which was a pretty big deal. We uh, would go audit the service center procedures and that and we went up to uh, in the end of my before we started our uh, senior year Jan and I got married and uh, I went up to Seattle on the government's money and we had our three-month honeymoon up in Seattle. I was making $3.35 an hour and we were saving all of it because we were on per diem. And we were living great, weren't we, Jan? Dinner every night, golfing shows, it was marvelous. We lived on uh, Queen Anne's Hill, great big tower and a big swimming pool. So, And from there I went to work for Arthur Anderson for four years in Los Angeles. Then to uh, Smith Brainy Smith brained Bernard and, and something like that. I had four job offers in Salt Lake and these guys were a smaller firm and I thought that they would pay me more. That's what they said. I got to them and found out it was a lie and found myself two days after I was here down in Florida for three months. Uh, and I came back and went to another company Tebs and Smith, I says, hey, I'm going to head back to Los Angeles. I hate this job. They lied to me. If you want to give me a job, great. Or if not, I'm heading back. They hired me. And from there, they broke apart. And two years later, so then it was just uh, Tebs and Smith. From Tebs and Smith, it was to uh, work for them 18 and a half years. Clem was the silver tongue devil. He'd tell you anything you wanted to hear. Nothing was ever in writing. I love you like a son, but I'm going to screw you worse than anybody you've ever seen. So he was, uh, he was a gem. We left him in 92 and uh, Bruce Turan and Hans Nevard and I formed a partnership and we worked together till uh, 2016 when I was sold my practice to PRPR and then we were merged with Squire two years later. That's my life. Yeah, I dated a lot. Um, always had girlfriends in junior high school. Uh, always had, uh, always went to all of the dances. Uh, always uh, had one uh, gal that lived about a mile away from me and I'd walk up to her house and her dad says, you gonna walk home? I says, yeah, it's no big deal. And uh, dated her for almost a year and then, I don't know, she dropped me for one of the best looking guys in the junior class. I thought that was unfair. I was better looking than him, but such is life. I always had dates, always went to the dances, always enjoyed it. Um, before I met Jan, I'd run into this gal that was across the street, Anita Johnson. And uh, it's the first girl that uh, after meeting her, first, she asked me to marry her. And I said, oh, I can't get married now. I, Maybe in a year and a half, you'll have to see how college going. And then uh, I think she's just trying to get out of her house. She married somebody else, and then I met Jan. I was going with another gal, and I met Jan in uh, January of 69, and that was it. Came home after the first date and told my mom I'm marrying that gal. My mother and I would sit out on the back porch and talk about it. Jan gave us lots to talk about because she told me she's going to marry Bruce a few times, so. We always had long chats. So I worked at the uh, Western Service Center and we worked in IMF adjustments and I worked with uh, Bruce Hunter and we were, we were good friends, pretty good. You know, he was two years older. He was the same age as Roger Richens, um, uh, a guy that grow, grew up in my ward and uh, went on a mission. But we worked together and we're working and one night there's a, a gal in the unit next to him and he, he says, you know, oh, can you get me lined up with that girl over there in the other unit? I said, sure. 
So I walked over and lined him up and he says, I'm feeling really guilty now. I've got a real good looking girlfriend. I hate the thought that I'm going out and she's sitting at home. Would you mind taking her out? And I said, sure, line me up. So he says, okay, we'll have our common friend, Roger Richens, line you up. So Roger Richens lines Jan and I up. We meet in oh, the, uh, it was the common place at the Weber State. Uh, it was the, kind of like the bowling alley, the, the place where we met. He met the lunch and everything else. And we met and... Uh, Roger introduced us, and I had a date, and I remember calling Jan up and saying, Hey, I'm Al Kofid. Who? You know, the guy Roger Richens. Oh, yeah, I remember. So we went out on a Thursday night. Excuse me, went out on a Friday night. I called her up and took her out on Saturday night, and she called me up and asked me to take her out on Sunday. So for the next geez, several weeks, I was taking her out three times a week. We hit it off really well, but she was always saying, you know, I've got this, you know, I've got Bruce, and she told me a few times, you know, I'm going to marry Bruce, and I said, well, that doesn't mean we still can't go out, does it? And uh, we did that, and uh, remember one of the funnest times we went with one of our friends, uh, she had a, was one of my good friends, and one of hers, we went up to the Uendas on the on the 24th of July, but on the 4th of July the 3rd, I guess, yeah, it was the, the 4th, I picked her up at 6 in the morning. We hiked to the top of Mount Ogden, had lunch in Mount Ogden, came down, it was raining, and it was just like, uh, man, I was, man, I was beaming. I was in love like you couldn't believe, and we were coming down that mountain, it was so neat, and then we went out, and I fried steaks that night, so... You know, how can you beat that? And then we went to the UN and to the Uendas and I gave her a book if I was a, a Rufus on the rooftop. Anyway, it's one of those funny books uh, that that was written and then a few weeks later she says, I'm marrying Bruce and I was devastated. And uh, I remember when she told me that, my dad knew I was having trouble. She says, What'd you like to do? I says, Well, why don't you take me up to the top of Monte Cristo? and let me come down on my bike and see how fast I get going. He took me up and he said I topped 60 miles an hour coming down that. I'm on that stupid bike. And I know that uh, there was another time during that same summer she told me and I thought, well, all right, I'm uh, gonna go with a group of guys and we're gonna ride from uh, Echo, Utah to Evanston to Mirror Lake in one day, 95 miles uphill. And uh, I did that, and on that same trip was a gal I dated. She was dating this guy that was the head of the downhill skiing, and her father had bet her that she couldn't do it, so she and I together had the cheap bikes, and uh, we came in together. Our power energy was uh, dried jello we were eating to give us the energy to get up that hill at night. So she had to make it because her father bet that she couldn't, <laughs> and we're both going, these bikes suck, but we made it and uh, went up that and come back down the next day. And um, I think it finally got to March or something. And uh, I'd kind of reached my point of too many, I'm gonna marry Bruce and Bruce was away at college and uh, it was March and I wanted to take her to a dance. And uh, we had the playoffs that Weber State was playing UCLA at the at uh, Brigham Young's thing and so we headed out early in the day and all the way down we drove uh, you know all the hot cars so we had a ball going down and we had a uh, just a great time we're coming home that night and I remember just kind of asking on our doorstep I was afraid to really ask her because I was afraid she's gonna say no I said uh, well, what would you think if I if I ask you to marry me. So I kind of couched it and she said, I would. I said, well then, would you marry me? And she thought I was kidding. I think she said yes. And so the next day I called her up and said, all right, let's go downtown tonight. We're gonna go get a ring. She says, you're really men? I says, yeah, I told my mom. And uh, so she had to call Bruce up and uh, tell Bruce she was gonna marry me. And we got the ring and I was on top of the world, so was kind of an interesting event. Our uh, reception was in our uh, chapel. My parents and Jan's sister helped us decorate the chapel. 
Uh, so it was very low budget. We were married in the Logan Temple. And, uh, you know, I know that both of us, we weren't, I don't know, our, our religious, our, our feelings about religion were not um, as solid. I believed it was a good way of life. I believed in it. But I'd watched uh, Dave, my older brother, get married and get divorced. He married a, a great party gal. That didn't last. Brent's marriage, I think he married Vicky twice. And I wanted a marriage that was like my dad's. And so I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get married in the temple, something that uh, stands for something. I don't know that I understood all the significance of it and everything else. And I remember going through the ceremony and uh, some of the things you said and that. I'm going, boy, this is even uh, more different than my Delta Sigma Pi. So some of it was interesting. But all I knew is at the end of the day, I got to sit across the altar and get married to Jan. And it didn't matter. We were, we were in love. So we came back. We had a, uh, a dinner at my house on the backyard. Obviously, her parents and sister couldn't come up to us, so they had to wait until we got home to celebrate it. And we had a dinner there, then the reception, and we uh, went to the Travel Lodge Motel to stay because we were going to head to Jackson Hole. And I know that uh, my sister tied a big can on the bottom of our car, and uh, you know, 62 Bel Air, watch out for that. We ran over something that screwed up something underneath the car, so. The next day, before we could head out, and it was interesting, we were in that lodge and we ran into a friend and, you know, it's like, I don't know why, you just, you're there on your honeymoon and you saw a friend or something and, hey, what's happening, dude? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was interesting. And then we got the car fixed and we're heading to Jackson Hole and my car overheats on the way and we're thinking, this is going to be really sweet. We, I had a golf bag that had a hood on it, and we'd go in the in the canal, and I'd get the thing, and I'd fill the car up with water, you know, the radiator, and we made it there, and we stayed at Signal Mountain Lodge, and uh, that was our honeymoon, mostly paid for by what Jan saved for her trip to, it was going to be with France with the Hunter family, so. Jan's always been special and unique. Uh, I think from the moment we met, we were two. We had just an absolute good time. Uh, conversation was always easy. Uh, we always got a laugh out of each other. She, me more than her, you know, because I was always funny. Um, we enjoyed every minute uh, being together. We've always uh, enjoyed everything that we've done. So. It's someone that I've always been able to talk to and relate to and just uh, love being around. And uh, someone that, uh, you know, smart. She, she got great ga grades. She worked well with others. Um, I thought for the first few years I had a stronger testimony to her. I thought that's, that's not fair, you know. And then I think she, while well, I did my scouting, she passed me and so our religious commitment, I always paid my tithing. I always did everything I, I wanted. I was never, I believed it was true. I really didn't know, know till Danny gave me the ultimatum and said, why don't you get your own testimony, Dad, when he was on his mission? And it changed my life from being a believer to knowing. So we grew up in the gospel together. We uh, always enjoyed each other. I always had a fun time. So awesome. she's always been the love of my life. So okay. Lori, from the time she was born, she was a, uh, anything I wanted to do, she would do. Um, she became my mountain girl. She became my beach walker. She rode on my bike with me. If there was something I wanted to do, she would do it. So she's fearless. Always enjoyed that about her. Um, as she grew older, uh, loved the young woman that she developed into. I'd take her riding my bicycle. I had a green backpack. I'd put her on and we'd go down and uh, go along the, the beach or whatever. So she was with me. I'd carry her on that backpack. 
when she was old enough to start walking, we bought her a big wheel, and um, she would wear out a, pen, a pair of tennis shoes in maybe a month period of time because she'd start up at the top of our hill. And she was not timid at all. She would come down that sidewalk going so fast, and then she'd turn the big wheels into our driveway, a 90-degree turn, and put her feet down and slide to a stop. So she was adventurous, and our little neighbor lady across the street, Frida, was always thinking something would happen to her, you know, that she would uh, get out of control. The only time Lori went further than what she was supposed to, she went all the way down to where the mall was in a big intersection. We, we found her. So Lori, uh, first child always, she went everywhere with us. Uh, I don't know, Lori was me. Um, there wasn't anything that Lori would never do. She always had as much energy in uh, anything that she attempted was just like me. So it didn't matter what came her way. It wasn't, I think I can do that. It was, I know I can do that, and I can do it rather quite well. So Lori always had a, a self-confidence that was uh, just incredible. The only thing that dampened her self-confidence was her, was her boyfriend in high school kind of put the limits and he was in charge and uh, he really took out the uh, competitive spirit in her and had her doubt herself and her art and a number of other things it wasn't until she met some good guy like you that straightened her back out that she had uh, endless potential so Lori did everything was everything and uh, the only time she doubted herself was when her boyfriend um, kind of told her that art shouldn't be her thing and she should do something different. One thing I remember about Lori, Lori was with some friends down at the junior high school and I pulled up in my bike and I was always, hmm, not too bad, I was thin and trim and, and in good shape and pulled up and I think the kids were confusing her that who's, who's this uh, young guy that's talking to you and I was proud that she said that's my dad, love that, it was a good eagle builder. As the kids got older, um, what I've always loved about Lori is that uh, she has a strong personality trait of mine. There isn't anything that she's afraid of doing. She always knows she'll be successful in anything that she tries. So that's always been fun to, to watch her. Uh, it was fun to watch her with uh, her callings uh, as a young mother and, and in the church where she was young women's president, stake young women's president. Um, she, I remember one time she was pregnant and was going to be outlawed to go or something. She insisted that she go. Either the baby was just going to be born or something else. She couldn't be left behind. She always had to be there and she always had to be kind of the chairperson to keep the activities going. Uh, Lori has a love and a passion for the gospel that I just love and respect. Um, she's always somebody you can count on. She's always a light with the lamp fully lit. Uh, she, one other character that I love about her, she loves to teach people art. Art is her passion. And uh, she does the school art. She does the kids coming to her house, working in the basement. She does things for her neighbors. She does things for the older release societies. Everywhere she goes, she charms people with her ease of communication and her love of art. I love that about her. One thing that uh, I really admire is the way that you and Lori have able, been able to work with your kids. Uh, they always know that there's always home, there's always love. I love uh, the spirituality of uh, Lori. Um, I love the way that she has made it through her trials her cancer, and then uh, the trials that she's had with the implants and the removal, and uh, all of the time she's been one of those that's always had faith, always was looking for a better day, always hoped for a better day, and had faith that it would happen. This last thing that she's gone through has been incredible, and uh, at the end of the day, she's herself again. She feels good, she looks good, and she's just happy with who she is. That's Lori. Couldn't be more pleased with Lori. Um, as far as young kids and screaming, Kelly was at the top of the list. I remember going to uh, 
Seattle, so we went through Boise and then to uh, to see my brother in Seattle, and Kelly cried the entire way, just screamed her head off. So traveling wasn't the best for her. Yeah. The two girls growing up were, uh, Lori was art, Kelly uh, was always interested in uh, dance. Uh, she took dance in, in all the different things. I think Lori did, but not as much. Lori was into the piano, loved her piano. Kelly tried piano and was pretty good at it, but Kelly was better at dance. She always enjoyed um, dancing, and I think in her uh, second year at uh, Brighton, she became on the dance team, and then her junior and senior year, she was a, a cheerleader. And uh, Kelly uh, was, was awesome. Kelly always... Uh, enjoyed being with everybody. She was with a, a wonderful group of friends that um, they were very popular, but they uh, stayed where they needed to be and, and were always uh, cautious. Um, Kelly wasn't like Lori. Kelly dated a number of people, and as soon as anybody said they liked her, that was the last she'd ever have to do anything with them. So, uh, whereas Lori went through high school with one boyfriend, Kelly dated everybody. And like I said, as soon as there was any hint that they liked her, that was the end of them. And uh, she had a great uh, growing up period of time. I remember uh, one of my fun moments was uh, she was, uh, I think, second runner up to uh, prom queen where I got to step out on the football field with her. And it was the only time in my life that I had a full beard. And uh, I got to, to step up there and she, uh, she was presented. In, in their younger years, we always uh, went on uh, trips. Uh, Kelly and Lori were, uh, in the early years, were our singers. We always uh, sang to all of our popular old uh, time rock and roll. You know, Three Dog Night, Foreigners, The Beatles, it didn't matter. We'd go on trips, and we always had a great time together. Kelly, uh, always have enjoyed Kelly. Kelly and Lori uh, were great companions. Uh, a lot of times there was a lot of uh, spark between them. Uh, it seemed like uh, Kelly and uh, Danny could uh, bring out the worst in Lori, as far as uh, kidding her. Uh, she took everything to heart that they said, and they uh, indicated just slightly they thought maybe they were a little too hard on Lori. <laughs> they always teased her about Chris. Anything that they could get Lori on, they teased her, and they delighted it. But um, the nice thing is, is that when we'd go places, uh, everything was okay. They just had fun. Uh, Kelly loved her uh, schooling. She loved her... Uh, dancing. She loved the cheerleading. Uh, she had a great time in school and had great friends. It uh, was interesting when you thought that you've got a daughter as a cheerleader and everything else, uh, a lot of people would be worried uh, with, uh, you know, would they party? Would they go to the wrong places? But uh, she always knew who she was. She always acted appropriately. Uh, and her friends, she couldn't have had better. So I'm extremely pleased of how she uh, went through and, and, and what she did. Funny thing about Kelly is she was dating. She dated so many people. We never had to worry about her making the right choice. She had so many people that she dated and as soon as somebody said she liked him, that was it for them. That was the wrong words to say. But Kelly is uh, just like Lori, she has uh, uh, energy, just incredible. Uh, those two with their uh, dancing and uh, the things they, they love. Lori and Kelly love to, to dance and exercise together. Kelly is a hiker. Uh, she loves camping. Uh, anything outdoors, Kelly loves. Some of the things I love about Kelly, Kelly is uh, such a strong person in the uh, gospel. She has such, such, a, such a strong testimony. Um, 
And she has a, a gentle side to her too. She is extremely caring. Um, she doesn't tell us much, but we learn from others that she'll go visit someone who's been sick or try to lift up someone who is feeling down. Uh, she's always uh, tried to help those in our family that she knows that they're struggling. She's always reached out to Steve or to Brent or those. She, she's just a very loving and caring uh, person. Another thing I love about Kelly is uh, the way she interacts with her, her kids. Um, Kelly was, as a child, a little bit harder. Uh, she had some tantrums once in a while, and uh, she had a lot of spunk. And we were thought it was very interesting when she got her children that uh, she got what she was, spunky, individualist, that liked to do things differently. And it's always been fun to watch Kelly as she has uh, worked with uh, each of her children who have a different personality or a different way about them. She knows how to uh, dance in and out of their moods, um, can take them when they've been uh, uh, in a very horrible mood and, and dance around it and, and make the best out of it. So Kelly, I guess, learned as she was growing up uh, and can remember some of her things. And she's been uh, so, so good with each of her children and uh, helping them through their uh, tough times and, and being there for them. So I love that about her. So she's... Uh, a wonderful daughter, a wonderful sister, a wonderful friend to Jimmy and, and Danny, and uh, she's just outstanding. I love her immensely. Jimmy came next. Jimmy was um, one that was always, uh, when he got old enough to uh, be able to talk and where we were going, he always came to the door and said, when are you guys going to be back? And always followed us out to the car. Always was wondering when we were going to come back. Um, Jimmy loved to fish. I remember getting him a, uh, a fishing vest when he was eight years old, and he and I would go down the uh, river, um, the big Cottonwood River. We'd be in our tennis shoes wading in the water, and we'd be fishing. We'd always go fishing. He loved that. Um, he was uh, someone who enjoyed his friends. Um, what could you say? He would be a little bit of a, I guess you could put it my own, he was a little bit of a hell raiser. He enjoyed um, doing things with his friends and we found out that he did a lot more when he was older and told us than we ever thought he did. He was uh, very good in um, taking things. I remember he started a fire in the field next door. He did a lot of uh, sloughing from school. Kelly had her moments too. Kelly was, uh, uh, she enjoyed going and skiing and doing, and Jimmy. I don't think Lori, Lori was too, too goody-goody, too shoe. She wouldn't slough a class for nothing. She always, she always had to be a hundred percent, and so she never took it lightly. But Jimmy and Kelly, they enjoyed their times away from school, and uh, they enjoyed that. Uh, of course, Jimmy, um, followed after me. I was a scoutmaster and uh, from the time that Jimmy was seven I'd have one two weeks off and one week would be scouting and so Jimmy went with me on all of my scouting adventures and uh, that picture in the kitchen of Lake Blanche is one of our favorites because that was the first time that we took uh, a group of eight-year-old kids up and took them on an easy hike I think he only had 3,000 vertical feet in two and a half miles, so it was killer. And uh, got them and their dads up there and got all bedded down for the night. And our tent was back in the trees, and I went to get some water, and Jimmy's eyes were about like that. He says, you're not going to be gone long, are you? Because there's all these noises in the bushes and things. He was really quite uh, terrified. And uh, so that was his first camping experience, and that's why when he found the picture of uh, Lake Blanche, he bought that, because that would uh, remind us of our, our camping. Uh, so from the time he was eight, he was always backpacking with me and scouting. Um, of course, I don't know, the girls probably would have loved pellet guns and BB guns, but uh, they were into other things. But Jimmy, 
had his first real sharp knife when he was eight. We had uh, knives uh, we got at uh, Yellowstone that were uh, out of uh, buffalo horns. And we still have those today. We've never lost them. He had a uh, real pow powerful pellet gun at eight. Of course, Jan was always in favor of that. That's sarcastically. She didn't like that. We always had the pellet guns. We always had fun doing that. Wrist rockets, pellet guns. So Jimmy was um, my outdoor man. But when I when we'd still go on hikes and that, Lori and Kelly would always uh, go on the hikes. So they weren't uh, they weren't ones to be put down or put in the back. They loved it. Um, Jimmy got into bike riding because I was scoutmaster, and all my scouts had to learn their cycling merit badge. Um, so he grew up kind of like me. I don't know, I always kind of got Jimmy to do different things. I bought some boxing gloves and when he was maybe six or seven, and, and Lori was saying, oh, you know, I, I can take care of you on that. So they put the boxing gloves on, and Jimmy pasted it right in the nose, and she uh, howled out. She didn't like that. Uh, so, of course, Jimmy has that uh, devilish little look. He thought that was pretty choice. I remember him doing that. So he's uh, always kind of been my shadow. Um, fishing at eight, pellet guns, uh, hiking, knives, backpacking. He went with me on every scout trip ever since he was eight years old. So he and I have enjoyed the outdoors immensely. Some things that are interesting about Jimmy is that Jimmy has a very calm personality. Um, when a friend needs somebody to go in and argue for him, uh, lately, uh, Jimmy will step in and do that. He's able to come into a, uh, a contentious environment. He's able to remain calm. He's able to get uh, what he wanted out of it. So Jimmy is an excellent reader of, of people. He says that he can figure out what somebody's going to be like in about the first 30 seconds with them and then can act accordingly to bring the best out in them and to uh, maximize himself as a uh, as a server or a waiter or a trainer. Uh, he works people really well. Notice I said works. He worked his teachers at school really well. <laughs> he has a gift with people. And that's uh, something. Jimmy's uh, totally an outdoors person. He loves the outdoors. He says uh, he loves the creations God has done. And he says, my spiritual chapel is the out of doors, and that's where I find myself relating to uh, God's handiworks. Uh, Jimmy's a trainer. He's uh, every dog that he's taken on. Uh, he's had some stubborn ones, Leroy, to mention one. He's had some others that have been challenging, but he seems like he can always work with them until they become exactly the dog that he wants. Every time he gets a new dog, we're going. How does he? Pick all the good ones. I think he is able to train them. Uh, we try our best to train, and we uh, end up being shorthanded when it comes to, to training. Uh, Jimmy is passionate about a lot of things, skiing and fishing and, and uh, things. Uh, it's fun to see him have a child now, and uh, as he walks with the child outside, having him touch the trees and the bark so that he can get the feeling of what life is and what the outdoors are like. We have always waited for Jimmy to have a child. We thought it would be so fun watching him and he and Pam are living up to our expectations. So uh, always have enjoyed Jimmy. Danny was the last and uh, Jimmy loved to give, uh, as he got older, he would love to ring Lori's bells. He could get her to bust out in tears so easily. Uh, it seemed like Lori gave Kelly a bad time, but Jimmy and, and uh, Kelly could give Lori a bad time and, and uh, got even with her. Now Danny, most all the kids grew up and they were really quite uh, easy going. Danny was one that was uh, a little higher strung. He was a uh, 
He hated anybody to look at him and he'd scream, don't look at me, and just turn red and you'd think he'd choke. Um, anybody give him a look during dinner, it was over. He uh, hated the clothes that Jan made, not that she made them, but she always liked to put him in those sailor outfits. And uh, she'd put him in there and he was screaming and we'd say, all right, we'll leave you. So we'd pull out the driveway, we was standing in the window screaming. Of course, we, went, we came back and got him. We thought maybe he'd cut the, uh, the screaming if we indicated we were going to go. I think he grew out of it at, uh, at two. Um, so he was, he was more difficult. Danny, is, uh, Danny was uh, a kid that could get upset pretty easily in his first two years. Kids would love to tease him, and he'd throw fits. And uh, he didn't like his clothes either that Jan made. Remember a little sailor suit that we put on him to go to church? He had a, a screaming fit, and we threatened to leave him. He didn't quit, so we started pulling out of the driveway, and you could just see him shouting in the window at us. So Danny, in his earlier years, had a little bit of a temper uh, because of that temper, the kids took advantage of it and tried to get him excited and uh, show his temper flares. As Danny grew up, uh, he was able to uh, intermix with friends really well. He loved to do things by himself really well. Uh, as he became an older person and uh, went on his mission, loved his mission letters, loved the way he related to people. He's such a good writer and his capability of, of writing and being able to tell what he wanted to tell uh, has improved immensely with time past. Um, Danny is an individual that uh, loves to help people, loves to mentor them. He's uh, well read. He uh, uh, can kind of um, help any individual. I remember when I was bishop, I said, hey, I got this lady with this particular problem. I need to find something. He says, oh, well, why don't you find it in, uh, what was that book you and Dennis love? Lightning, Spiritual Lightning? Anyway, he knew the part, and he says, why don't you turn to page 186? It's about in the middle of what you're looking for. And so if I ever had a question, what about this? He always had an answer for me. I uh, credit Danny with helping me get past my uh, problem of my my testimony. I always had a testimony, but it was very weak. And Danny helped me develop and uh, come out of that shell. And, and I love the fact that uh, when we have problems with uh, teenagers or anybody in the family, uh, Danny, will you call them up and help them out? So Danny is a mentor for each of us individually and for uh, all of us with our children and grandchildren, if there's anything he can help, he would love to uh, mentor and help him. Danny just kind of followed behind Jimmy. He did the scouting and everything with me. He wasn't quite into as much of the uh, the backpacking. Uh, Danny liked instruments and the band and, and ran into some kids that enjoyed band. And, so, and Danny uh, was a Lego guy. Jimmy was a a hunter, a fisher, and the other, and Danny preferred uh, Legos and uh, quiet time with his toys. And so he's a little bit different in that respect, but he still uh, loved to go on our trips. Jimmy would always ask me, let's go fishing, and Danny had come along, but it was, it was kind of Jimmy's idea. We started all the kids skiing as soon as they could. I loved to ski, and we'd give them ski stuff for Christmas, and they had all skied with us. Uh, and that was awful fun. Um, I can't remember whether it was Lori or Kelly that we were on the Alda lift and she was being really good because the lift was up kind of high and I said, man, look at that. We're so high you can see the valley down there and, and one of them just freaked out on me like she was going to fall out of the chair. It scared her to death. But uh, Jimmy, uh, I think, took to skin a little bit easier. He loved the powder. He loved... Uh, uh, a little bit more dangerous things. Um, we uh, enjoyed our trips. Jan um, made the trips always pleasant. We always had presents that had to be unwrapped every 
hour, and if they were bad, they'd have to wait another 15 minutes. So we didn't have VCRs or anything else. We just uh, sung along, and when the present time would come, if they'd been good, they'd get their present. If not, it'd be postponed 15 minutes, and and that always worked. We always Janet always get a ton of gifts, and they were always wrapped, and so the kids always had a great time. We uh, went everywhere together. Um, Yellowstone was one of my favorites because it was mine growing up. Probably the funnest trip they ever had was when we rented a, uh, well, we didn't rent. We owned a 28-foot uh, motorhome with Bruce Duran. Our friend Bob Stanworth said, this is how you can really make money. So, Because all of the uh, actors would, would rent these, and he had made a lot of money. So as soon as we bought ours, they quit doing that. So we had a, a motorhome that was big and beautiful and thought, well, we'll go on a trip and we drove it down to California. I hated it. I thought, what is the use of buying a motor home and then having to go spend some place and spend 30 bucks a night to hook up to a sewer? It just made me furious. So I would find a park or a cemetery and we would park and of course I didn't want to be caught by the police in the morning. So I'd start driving and everybody was still asleep. I remember once in California I turned over a thing and we went over a curb and gutter. Did I throw them all out of bed, Jan? People fell out of the bed onto the floor. Um, I really didn't like the motorhome. The kids said it was the best time they ever had in their life on a trip. So, always enjoyed the kids growing up. They were all different. Lori's the artist. Kelly was the dancer, the cheerleader. Jimmy. Uh, he uh, was able to uh, get good grades by conning the teachers. He, he could always talk his way out of uh, a bad grade. They loved him. He was a, a, a people-pushing person. And uh, Danny just uh, got good grades. I don't know that Danny slept that much. Danny was kind of a stickler like uh, Lori was. Morning. Always look forward to our summer trips. Our summer trips with our kids were always outstanding. Um, no quarreling, no fighting. We always had presents for them. And um, there would be about an hour to an hour and a half between stops where they'd get a present. And if they had acted the least a little bit bad, then the present uh, would, well, that's another 15 minutes away, or that's a half an hour away. So we had no videos, anything else, but we always had a great time, always had good gifts always sung along to the old rock and roll music that Jan and I loved. So trips, we always remember, love it. So those are the, those are the kids and that's growing up. Loved them all. I, I had a passion for sailing. Okay. Um, we were in uh, California and finished an audit and uh, one of the partners had a great big sailboat, a 45 foot slip, a racing boat. And, we all went to the Los Angeles Yacht Club, you know, 10 couples took us out on his yacht and we're sailing and a big wave came up and drenched us all and Jen spends the next two hours throwing up in the, in the bottom of the boat and I'm up there going, this is the neatest thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, we moved back to here and I got two small sailboats because somebody couldn't, didn't have the money but he had some boats and so I became interested in um, sailed a lot of years and as soon as Jimmy was seven or eight years old he was my helmsman and uh, he guided the racing boat as I st I did everything else he steered it till he was about 16. Danny didn't quite have that passion but um, uh, we had that I had sailboats all my kids uh, they were raised and born on a sailboat I remember uh, Kelly we uh, had a small sailboat and she's like six weeks old and we got her out in the sailboat and she's down underneath. We have pillows on each side so as the boat would tip up and down she'd rock back and forth and and uh, bought a bigger boat older when we got older and I think Kelly was uh, maybe nine years old and Jimmy was seven and uh, I'd bought a 25 footer and it was was a great machine and we went out there to race and I had uh, my nine-year-old girl and my seven-year-old boy and they said all right who's going out there and they said Alf who's your crew and I said right here Kelly and and uh, and Jimmy and they said uh, today's awful blustery out there we're going to assign somebody to go with you because I think you're going to be in trouble and uh, 
they were right. So they put somebody with me and uh, we went out. It was extremely windy and that, and it got to the point where the boat was heeled on one side. Jimmy had gone down and was using the bathroom and we turned the boat and it went like this and rolled him over and the porta potty on top of him. And he'll always remember that. So we had uh, a lot of sailing. We uh, had a lot of vacations up to uh, Bear Lake with our sailboat up there. We brought all the kids out. All the girls would bring their friends out on their birthday and we'd go out sailing into the middle of the night and anchored out in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. And I'd have them go clear up to the, not to the top of the mast. And, you know, the boat would sway. The kids loved it and we'd sail at midnight. So we had a lot of fun with the sailboat and the kids. We had, we had a lot of memorable family vacations. Um, we, we always had to go up to Jackson. Jackson. We always had to go to Yellowstone. We um, always loved going down to uh, Laguna Beach. We rented a home in Laguna Beach and brought uh, some of Kelly's friends and Lori's friends down there and had spend the week in California. That was, that was one of our favorite spots to go. We'd go down there, the kids would swim, and Jan and I would play tennis. She was an avid tennis player, and she whooped me for years until I got Janice Stevens to help me out, and then we, we would battle in the sun for hours and had a ball. And the kids had, uh, did what they did, so our... Yeah, our vacations at we, Disneyland, SeaWorld, California, Yellowstone. That was, that was probably our most disappointing trip. We had expectations of uh, that those guys would be just like me. They'd get up at 6 in the morning and go swimming. So I had all these high expectations of, all right, because Jan doesn't like to get in the water that much. And I thought, okay, I've got a boy that's 14 and 16. I bought snorkels for him, a mask, and I thought, we're just going to swim our heads off. So I'd get up at 6, oh, I'm too tired, noon, oh, I'm too tired. So they'd finally get up about noon, and then um, they wouldn't do a whole lot. They wanted to stay and walk out at night on the beach and do things. So when we wanted to go on a drive to see other spots, oh, I don't want to do that, I'm too tired. And I thought, are you kidding? If we'd had Lori and Kelly, they would have done everything. Jimmy and Danny were the biggest boobs on that trip. I can't believe how they underperformed to my expectations. I thought I'd have some companions to swim with and snorkel with and they were zeros. You guys might think you're a one. I'll give you a zero. It was bad. Well, the best part is I had Jan who was always with them. The hardest part was trying to find time to do everything with them. I'd leave early in the morning and come home at night so I could see them before they went to bed. I worked too much. I think that uh, part of the hardest things was is that uh, we always tried to do our part, always tried to get the family home evening going. That was always kind of a, of a hard thing. They were pretty cooperative till they got older and then it kind of fell apart. So trying to uh, get them interested in family home evening was was tough but I think just uh, finding enough time for me to interact with them during the week when I had the overtime was really hard and thank goodness for Jan so Jan always called herself the enforcer and I was the pleaser and tried to make up for my uh, not being around as much and uh, if you ask her that's probably what she's gonna say that she, I was the mellow nice guy trying to win them back for all the overtime that I worked. Um, as far as uh, the hardest time raising them, we really didn't have a hard time. I think uh, the hardest point sometimes is when people want to, uh, you're hoping that they're going to follow all your guidelines and all your beliefs and that's just given and then you find that uh, kids have their own attitudes, have their own policies, have their own agenda. And, some of those don't quite fit the same as yours. So I think when that reckoning came, that was a hard thing to deal with, that they could possibly want to do something different than what we wanted them to do. Uh, so that was, that was hard. Had the easy part. I was the fun-loving guy and Jan was the enforcer. So I loved it all. I am proud of my children because they are the finest people I know. They are the kindest, most loving, they care about others. They're not uh, puffed up into themselves. They uh, give credit to where credit's due. 
uh, you be around them, they're, they're at ease in talking with adults, they handle themselves well in any situation, and it's always been that um, they've always kind of had an attitude like me. Um, there isn't anything they can't do. They have great confidence in themselves. Um, they're uh, relentless in their energy, as you well know. Lori won't give up on anything. Kelly's the same. Jimmy is um, the same, but his passions in not giving up were leaning more towards uh, skiing and fishing and doing the things that he uh, loved. Um, Danny has always had the passion to be the best he could too. So that's, I think that's the joy that all of our kids uh, wanted to be the best whatever they were at and that they could interact with our friends or any other adults and carry themselves well. So that's what I'm proud of is that they're great people. Everybody loves them. That's kind of an interesting one. I had a, uh, two years ago, I had an opportunity to really, to really think about it. Um, I'd gone sailing with a, a good friend and on the way home we were talking about our, our life-changing moments um, when we really uh, hooked on to the gospel. Um, mine was later in life. I uh, grew up in the typical Mormon home good parents. We always went to church. I was always a hundred percenter. Um, always went to seminary. I have to admit I slept through a lot of it. I wasn't that attentive in, uh, in the seminary. I don't think I graduated from seminary either, which was a disappointment to my mom. Um, but I uh, always, always went to church and did what I, you know, what I was supposed to. I didn't go on a mission and I um, always felt my bishop had really, Bishop Teeples had really let me down. He never called me in for an interview, never asked me. It was always my parents, why don't you go ask him to, to, to have an interview with me? I thought, I'm not going to go ask the bishop to have an interview with me. If he wants to interview me, he'll come and talk to me. And it was during the Vietnamese War, so there were just a few that got to go. It seemed like all my friends did. I always thought my whole life that me and Mike Gerard were the only people in our high school class that never went on a mission. Found out later at the 50th that there were a number of them that didn't. Same problem as me. So I always thought that I was the only one that didn't go. And I always felt bad that I hadn't. And uh, it didn't really bother me too much until we moved to California and we lived in an apartment with nine other uh, friends, all of them here from uh, Salt Lake and Ogden. Most of us went to Weber or BYU and got down there and all of them had been on a mission though and they heard their stories and how great things were and you know investigators would read the Book of Mormon and bells and whistles would go off and so I thought you know for some guy that's always been active I ought to do that and I'll read it when I get through. The bells and whistles will go off just like they said and, and it'll be great. So I uh, decided I'd read it I have to admit, I, I read it. I didn't ponder it. I didn't color it like I did now. I didn't stop and ponder. I was uh, reading it to get through, because when I got through, I knew that I could get down and, and have that uh, promise. If you read the Book of Mormon and sincerely pray about it, that you'd get your answer. I, I prayed. Nothing. I didn't get a feeling, tingling, nothing. I thought, man, I am a real dud. I don't know what's wrong with me. And um, from that point on, it was, it was interesting. Um, I have never failed at anything. And to uh, read the book and then do what it asks and pray and have nothing hit me, it was like, what is wrong with me? And um, I let that kind of tone my, uh, my feelings for quite a while. I was still you'd look at me and say, hey, outwardly, I do everything. I was a scoutmaster for 35 years, so I had to study only enough to give the lesson to the deacons and the 11-year-old uh, scouts, which is not too trying, and um, had a few other things in there. I was a, got to be called a counselor in the Bishop Brick and in the, when we were up in Top of the World, and the state president says, do you have any questions? I says, yeah. 
I said, um, does it bother you that I believe the Book of Mormon, but I don't have a testimony of it? I don't know that it's true. I said, you know, I didn't have too much luck when I tried. And he says, no, you'll, you'll, you'll be all right. You'll get through it. And so I thought, okay. So I did all of my things and um, paid my tithing. So I was what you'd call a believer. I didn't know for sure. I had faith. I hoped. I hoped what we're doing is right. And um, in the back of my mind, it was like, I'm not going to try the praying again about the Book of Mormon. I thought, what would I ever do if I prayed the second time and didn't get an answer either? Then I don't know what I'd do. So um, I just was active in all my callings and did my best. And it wasn't until um, Danny, and, and Danny knew my struggles. He went on his mission and um, after he'd been out a while, he knew that uh, I believed, but I didn't know. I didn't have a t big testimony. And so he asked me to read the Book of Mormon with him. And he said, I want you to, to underline it, like his uh, mission president had told him. And I want you and Mom to, each week, tell me something that impressed you and why it impressed you. And um, I got doing this and, and found that uh, the Book of Mormon was starting to come to life to me. I uh, loved the challenge of... Uh, finding something and uh, you know we didn't have email back then so the letters between us were several weeks from one to the other so you know you didn't have the continuity like you did but I, I looked forward to his letters and what he had found and what we did and it got to the point that I, he was having so much success in that I told him I says you know if only I'd gone on a mission so I started saying you know I could have been like you if I'd gone on a mission. I put everything back to some way or other, I didn't measure up. I didn't feel like I measured up to God because uh, whatever I did, I wasn't going to get the confirmation everybody else did. So I always kind of put that in the back. And I'd been making those comments to Danny for a while. And finally, Danny sent me a letter. <laughs> I still have it. It was interesting. He said in the letter, he said, you know, you're always great in a lot of things. You're a great sailor. You're a great this. You're great that. You always do those things, but the one thing that you haven't really done and put the effort in, he says, you've never really put the effort in that you've done to everything else to get your own testimony. And he says, uh, this will be strong, but I'm calling you to repentance. In essence, get off your butt and start reading and finding for yourself that the it's true. All you've got to do is spend the time and energy to uh, to find out for yourself. His wasn't quite that strong, and I was writing that talk and put that. And he says, I wasn't quite that forceful, Dad. I told you you did a lot of good things, and I thought it was just time that you stepped out and uh, uh, started studying. And his letter indicated, he says, you know, it's not going to come all at once. It's going to come piece by piece, little by little, and it'll come over time. So from the point of that letter... I started uh, reading every night, started studying, did my Book of Mormon, did the other things. Shortly thereafter, I got called to be Young Men's President, and I'd had such a miraculous uh, experience with the Book of Mormon color coding in that. I had uh, three years where I passed out one of those $28 colored pencils, and we would read the Book of Mormon together, and in class we would sit and talk for 25 or 30 minutes on what we read and what impressed us, and all of the kids we had probably the neatest bonding and spiritual growth ever. We read all of their missionary books and, and used the color coding. And so that process that Danny told me over a period of years, I got to the point where I really developed my own testimony. Then I got called to be a, in the high council and I thought, man, that's a mistake. I'm a scoutmaster. I don't relate with adults. I can't give talks. And... Um, I'd been in there two weeks and had an interview. The, the executive secretary says, the state president would like to talk to you. I thought, well, he's discovered that I'm not the great person he thought I was. He's going to release me. <laughs> he didn't. Uh, he put me in with the uh, watching over the young men's and the young women's, um, something that I was good at. So that and having to uh, 
study and read and give talks. Talks have never been my easy point. I'd spend, this is probably understating, I'd spend 40 hours a talk to, uh, to put mine together because I thought, I don't really have anything of myself to say. I need to find somebody else that is uh, wiser and smarter and uh, I'll use their information and kind of put it into a talk. And that all changed when um, I had given the assignment to talk on the Infinite Atonement before I knew it was out five months and I thought, how am I going to give a talk on the Infinite Atonement? I'm going to get up there and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I don't know that He is. Am I supposed to get up there and just say, I believe? I didn't want that. So I spent five and a half months preparing. I fasted. I prayed. It was on my mind all the time. I'd listened to Jesus the Christ going back and forth to work. And I finally started with all the reading and studying, started to have some promptings and feelings. And I didn't even know what they were. I'm talking to Danny. I said, hey, I'm driving down the highway and I'm listening to Jesus the Christ. And I, I start choking up and I've got tears running down my face. I said, what is that? He says, that's the Holy Ghost witnessing to you that uh, that you're you're finding that Jesus is the Christ and it's being manifest to you through the Holy Ghost. So I didn't even know how the Holy Ghost worked. And so I went from at 52 until uh, maybe eight years where I was young men's president for five and then in this high council for three, that I went from having, I had a belief to an extremely strong testimony and it came little by little, piece by piece. And um, it was because I finally decided to spend the time and I finally found that uh, uh, God didn't have anything against me. It was, uh, I don't know, some people I think that they have to um, work and do things themselves. I always found it that those people that were able to read and say, yeah, I read that and had the, the witness. I'm going, well, it didn't happen to me. It didn't happen to Clayton Christensen. It didn't happen to a lot of others. It comes later in life when you start uh, connecting and, and doing your part. And that's how mine was. So mine came as uh, after I was 52. 52 to 62 were my biggest growing years I ever had. And I went from a very weak testimony to a very absolute strong testimony. And uh, the biggest thing that happened to me after my high council is uh, I love golf and I'm out there walking on the course at night playing. And um, I'm on the ninth hole. And I had this unbelievable impression that I was going to be called to be a bishop. I thought, <laughs> that's a joke. I said, if there's any truth to that, now you should never try to, um, you know, ask for a miracle or anything. I said, all right, if this has anything to do it serious enough, I'm 135 yards out. I'm going to put the ball in the hole. I hit the shot and I was within about four inches of the ball going in the hole. And I thought, that's pretty close. <laughs> I think I'm in deep trouble. And um, so for months, I started having that feeling and December comes along and every time I drive past our church, I'd get this impression, that's your office, that's your office. You ought to start thinking about counselors. And I'm going, this is crazy. This is really crazy. And um, it came to uh, the end of December and uh, I had a calling. I was still in the high council and um, the executive secretary says the uh, state president would like to visit you and your wife. And uh, I says, yeah, what for? And he says, oh, he just wants to see how you're doing. I'm going, yeah, right. I knew I was going to get called as bishop. And so it was on a, it was on a, a Sunday and I said, Jan, I says, hey, let's go to the temple on, um, on Saturday. She says, why? I says, I'm going to get called as bishop tomorrow. And she says, <laughs> you're not either. And I says, well, just humor me and go. And so we go to the meeting and uh, the state president calls her in and she looks at me like, I guess you're right. It was for me. And she comes back out and I get called and 
after they got through, I said, I have to ask you something. I said, uh, I had the strongest impression in July that I was going to be called as bishop. Just this unbelievable experience. They looked at each other and they all smiled and they said, uh, we submitted your name to be bishop in July, but it got returned because we needed to have the other bishop serve his five years and that wasn't up till December. And I thought, okay. Uh, I had some experiences with my counselor, so I always thought that uh, I got called to positions because I was a nice guy. But I knew, I knew without a doubt, the Lord called me to be a bishop. And so I went from not knowing to having an unbelievable testimony, and I had unbelievable experiences as bishop. So went from not having a testimony to an extremely strong testimony. What advice would I like to leave with my grandkids? The biggest thing, I hope that uh, they, through their own efforts, uh, I know we've got a lot of individual grandkids that uh, do their own thinking. Uh, sometimes they've felt that uh, religion has been pushed on them too hard. So they've kind of said, that's, that's not my thing, kind of let me be at it. and. Um, I just hope that some point in time that they'll get like me, that they'll find that uh, what they were brought up in, that they have a chance to really look and search it themselves and, and, and get their own answer. So I hope that um, all of them, you know, at some point in time in their life will really take a deep look. A lot. So I'd like the kids growing up that no matter what we're involved in, whether it's religious or not, if it's a family activity, we go as a family. And uh, we work uh, and do things together. It doesn't matter what. If somebody's got a homecoming or somebody's got a baptism or whatever, we go and support. We may not be total believers or whatever else, but we've got family. So I'm always saying you got to support your family and all that they do. Um, we always try to create uh, opportunities to enjoy each other and vacations that will give you memories so that when you have uh, kids of your own, you can look back and say, "Hey, I want to take uh, I want to take my kids to the Wind Rivers, like Grandpa took the grandkids to the Wind Rivers, or I want to go to Jackson or Yellowstone or all these other things. I want to develop memories to when they look back, they say, you know, uh, Grandma and Grandpa loved us. They uh, wanted to be with us. They went out of their way to provide opportunities on vacation and that to where you get to know them." They even brought Grandma Kofod with them. Uh, we're a family. I always love the family atmosphere. And so uh, always keep in mind that your family loves you no matter what. Uh, you can always count on them to come through for you and everything. So family's your greatest asset. And make sure you contribute back to make it your greatest uh, asset also. Uh, just want you to know. Jan and I love you unbelievably, and uh, having you grandkids has brought so much joy to us. That's, uh, that's our fulfillment. That's the payoff. Kids were wonderful. Grandkids are fantastic, and all of you together make our life enjoyable. Thank you for being part of it. Uh, so when I get through looking at my kids, I think... Uh, Things that Jan and I pride ourselves more about in life is, is our children. Love our children. Doesn't matter who we're with or where we're at. Uh, we can't say enough about our children. Uh, hope I didn't leave anything out, but uh, I just want to say that uh, my children mean everything to me. And each of them have different personalities and attributes and that. But when you stand back and look at them, you go, wow, now there is a talented group of great people. I love them. Thanks. Stop it. We can if we need to. Okay. Am I looked? Uh, am I casual enough? Do you want my hands folded? Do you want my no, hands on I'm top of my head? You from right here. Up. Up. Anyway, so we so, don't care. Yeah. Sadie, you're out of the focus, so you can bark or move or do anything you want, girl. Okay. Let's. Uh, All right. We'd always ride our bikes to the place. And uh, our 
All right, so Lori's my youngest, and uh, oldest. Well, she was first, <laughs> so we'll put her as oldest. 